If you have a Bible, you can open to Isaiah chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be a blue hardback under one of the chairs around you. And in that Bible, it is page 678, Isaiah chapter 7. So for the last few weeks, we have been studying the book of Isaiah, and if you haven't been here for the last couple of weeks, or if it's just been a while and you have a life and other things to think about and you need a refresher, let me catch you up to speed. Uh, The the book of Isaiah is essentially a collection of oracles and, and poems and sermons by an 8th century BC prophet named Isaiah. Uh, He ministers for like 40, almost 50 years, and then a few decades after his death, some of his protégés collect his material and they arrange it into a a way that communicates the points that he was trying to make in his ministry. And uh, that scroll becomes the book of Isaiah. And so we're committing 10 weeks to study this book, but, but the reason that we're studying it is not just that we want to understand Isaiah better, but through the study of Isaiah, we want to come to a better understanding of Jesus, and we want to be better equipped to serve him and, and to fall uh, more deeply in love with him and, and to pledge a deeper allegiance to, to Jesus. And so we're committing this whole summer to studying this book. Now, I say the whole summer. Next week, we're not going to do Isaiah. Because next week, Edmund is here. And, uh, and so we're going to take a break from Isaiah. We're just going to uh, push pause for a week, and we're going to go do something else. Uh, and there are a few, a few reasons for that. One is that Edmund is... Uh, they, they've not been doing this study with us. They're not three weeks into it. They won't be three weeks into it. And uh, so I don't want to just plunge them into something that they don't know, and then they're going to go back home the next week. It, that just doesn't seem like the best way to be a blessing to them. And the other reason is that uh, those of you who have been here when Edmund is here, you feel the energy in the room. It's not a normal Sunday. It's a, it's a very, it's a high energy, it's a different kind of Sunday. And so I just want to recognize that by not just plodding along in what we've been doing. I, I want to do something excuse me, a a little bit different. So next week I have a treat. I have footage that I took in Israel that I want to share, and uh, and we'll use that as sort of a launching point for thinking uh, about uh, the text for next week. But today, though, we're going to keep going in Isaiah, and we're going to do chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Got to get through 66 chapters in 10 weeks you're going to have to do big blocks like this. So we're not, I'm not going to try to read the whole thing. We're not going to do verse by verse. We're just going to do a 20,000-foot flyover, and I want to try to pick up the, the tune of this section because it, it is one section. Uh, so I want to help us think through what's happening in this and how does this passage, this whole section, prepare us to hear about Jesus. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Our, our great God, we thank you that you've brought us together this morning. We thank you uh, for the security that we enjoy in you and, uh, and, and in the promise of your resurrection. Lord, we pray that you will be with us this morning. Uh, we pray that you will guide our thoughts and that you'll guide our hearts and that you will soften our hearts and turn us toward yourself. Lord, we pray for our uh, community. We pray for Edmund on their way up next week. We pray that you will be working in them and uh, that you will be equipping them to serve you Uh, even as they're uh, far from home. Lord, we love you, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Isaiah chapter 7, we'll just get into it. The first two verses say this. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as trees of the forest shake before the wind. Does everybody catch all that? There's like a dozen names floating around. We got different kings and different nations and what is happening. Let's sort all this out real quick. There are three kings that are involved here. The first one is Ahaz. Ahaz is in the line of David. He is the king of of, uh, the nation of Judah. 
He lives in Jerusalem, Ahaz. The second king is uh, Pekah. Pekah is the son of Ramalia. He is the king of Israel up in the north. And his palace, I think, is in Shechem or Samaria. I forget off, off the top of my head. But he lives in the north. And he's much, much, much bigger than Judah is. And then the third king is Rezin, and Rezin is the king of the nation of Syria, or your translation might say Aram, which I like better, just because it's easier to keep Aram straight than, than Syria. Uh, so three kings and three nations. And what's happening in this passage is that the king of Israel and the king of Aram, or Syria, are ganging up on Ahaz, the king of Judah, and they're going to attack this little old nation, and they're going to take this little old city. I would equate this, if you're trying to think of a picture here, I would think of like two Rottweilers ganging up on a teacup poodle. Okay, that may communicate for some of you. Two big, fierce dogs teaming up on a little defenseless dog. And Ahaz is afraid. He's at the house of David, and, and when he hears that these two big nations are coming to attack him, the, the text says that he shakes. His heart shakes like the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And so he's starting to ask himself, is there any hope? Is there hope for Jerusalem? Is there hope for Judah with these two nations coming to destroy me? Uh, now, Isaiah does not describe what happens next. He just kind of assumes that you know what happens next. Because this is, this is called the Syro-Ephraimite crisis. If you want to like, Google it and learn more about it, you can, that's the term to look for, Syro-Ephraimite crisis. Uh, but this is a moment in Israel's history that is pivotal. If you want to know all about it, you can look at it, 2 Kings chapter 16. But Isaiah doesn't go into it because you're just supposed to know. Uh, what happens is Ahaz is so afraid of Israel and Aram that he sends a message to tiglath Pileser III, the king of a fourth nation, Assyria. That's why I like Aram better, because then I don't have to keep Syria and Assyria straight. He sends a message to this fourth king and says, hey, come and help me. These guys are ganging up on me. And he takes all the gold out of the temple and he sends it off to go pay him. And he says, we'll be your loyal subjects and we will pay taxes to you and we will be your people. But just please save us now. That moment was a turning point in Israel's history. That, that was the kind, that's like a 9-11 kind of moment, a JFK assassination kind of moment, but you never forget where you were when you heard that Ahaz had called for Assyria. It's a huge moment that changes the trajectory of the history of Israel. Uh, and so Isaiah doesn't feel the need to describe that for you. You would just know how he responded. Uh, and when Assyria comes, the reason he calls Assyria is that if Israel and Aram are Rottweilers and Judah is a teacup poodle, Assyria is like a grizzly bear. They're, they are the world superpower of the day. They're the biggest, strongest, most powerful empire in the world up to that time. And, and here's little old Judah calls on Assyria, please come, help me. And Aram, or, uh, sorry, Assyria comes. They say, okay, sounds good. And they march on Damascus, the capital of Syria at the time. Uh, and they level Damascus. And then they march into Israel, and they destroy Israel. And that moment also, that, that's a big part of why this is such a turning point. God's people are annihilated, and those who survive are deported. Assyria imports people to dilute the culture <coughs> and to just wipe the memory of Israel from off the face of the earth. And they, uh, they absorb, they destroy this is a huge turning point for Israel. Now, 20 years later, uh, Ahaz, who sent the message to Assyria, Ahaz is dead. And his son was king, and his son is now dead. And so his grandson, Hezekiah, is now king. And Hezekiah has been living as a uh, client of Assyria, or a, a patron of Assyria, 
for so long that he's tired of it. And he sends messages to the nations around him and says, we don't, we're not going to take it. No, we're not going to take it. And, and he stops paying his taxes. And they prepare to do battle with the great world superpower of Assyria. And, and Assyria says, you've got to be kidding me, of course. And so Assyria comes in and they wipe out Judah. They go into all these little towns. They level these towns. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. You can see the burn layers where, where Sennacherib comes in. And Sennacherib is tiglath uh not predecessor, after, successor, thank you. Uh, so Sennacherib comes in and he levels Judah. He comes in from the south and Jerusalem is all that's left. And he surrounds Jerusalem. He lays siege to Jerusalem but by the grace of God, Jerusalem survives. How are we doing? Does that all make sense? We kind of follow in the history. I know it's like I didn't come to hear about history. We're going to get there. Okay. Um, I want to share something with you that I don't know when I'll ever be able to plug this into a sermon, but it's cool, and so I'm going to do it here. In 1830, there was a guy named Charles Taylor, who's an archaeologist. He's working in northern Iraq, which was part of a Syrian territory. And he found this cylinder. It's actually not a, a perfect cylinder. It's, um, I think it's hexagonal. But it has writing, cuneiform writing, which is like the international language uh, all over it. And what it is, it describes Sennacherib's military campaigns and his reign. It's an Assyrian artifact that's commissioned by Sennacherib to describe his, how great and powerful of a king he was. And in that, uh, uh, the, it's called the Taylor Prism, because Charles Taylor is the one who found it. In that prism, I had a slide, but we're having technical difficulties. It says this, As for Hezekiah, the Judahite, who had not submitted to my yoke, I surrounded 46 of his strong walled towns and innumerable small places around them and conquered them by means of earth ramps and siege engines, attack by inf infantrymen, mining, breaching, and scaling. 200,150 people of all ranks, men and women, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, cattle, and sheep without number, I brought out and counted a spoil. He himself, Hezekiah, I shut up in Jerusalem his royal city like a bird in a cage. I put watch posts around him and made it impossible for anyone to go out of his city. It's the, Char it's the Taylor Prism, Sennacherib's Annals. You can Google that. What's interesting is he says, I shut him up like a bird in a cage, which is a really nice way of saying what? That he couldn't take the city. He failed to conquer Jerusalem. That's political spin at its finest. Now, the Bible itself also has political spin. It's very pro-David. It's very pro-Israel. But uh, Hezekiah, or uh, sorry, Sennacherib has his own share. I just think that's cool. It's a it's a verifiable Assyrian artifact describing something that happened in the Bible. And he himself says, I couldn't take Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem survives, and Assyria just waylays everything else. They take the, the, the number two city, the second biggest city, which is Lachish. They take the, the second biggest city and all these other towns, 46 of them in innumerable little villages and so on. They destroy everything. And God is not pleased with this. So when we get to chapter 10 of Isaiah, there's a little passage about uh, what God is going to do to Assyria. In chapter 10, verse 5, he says, Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. But he does not so intend, and his heart does not so think, but it is in his heart to destroy. And then down in verse 12, when the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. So Isaiah 
living through this siege of Jerusalem, makes this audacious claim that Assyria is a rod in the hand of God, or we might say a switch, or a paddle, or something like that. This is God using Assyria to discipline and punish his own people. Can you imagine? He's using the bad guys to discipline his own people. And they need to be punished. Assyria needs to be punished because they've gone too far and because they weren't submitting to God when they did it. They, it was in their heart that they just wanted to destroy Judah. And, and God's got a real problem with that. They've gone too far. They have been too bloody and too merciless. And so they also need to be punished. And this raises the question, so why, why does God think that Judah needs to be punished? What has Judah done wrong? If God is sending Assyria to, to go in, it seems like they were just trying to fight the man and, and, and the man kind of crushed him. But God says, well, no, actually, that's not the man crushing you. It's me crushing you. Okay, well, why? What did Judah do to deserve that? Three things. One thing that they did was they rejoiced when Israel fell. When the grizzly bear first came to their aid and took out the two Rottweilers and, they, and leveled Aram and leveled Israel, Judah rejoiced. So in chapter 8, verse 5, the Lord spoke to me again, because this people, Jerusalem, has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Ramalia. So they're rejoicing over the, the fall of these two nations. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. So Judah stands up on the top of their tallest mountain. They stand up on Jerusalem. And they look to the north and they see smoke rising from the villages where their nemeses used to be in Israel. And they celebrate and they have a feast. The bad guys are gone. Israel is gone. But God looks at that same smoke coming from those same cities and God does not celebrate. Because those two were his children. And yes, the, the, the donkey knows its owner and the ox its master's crib, but my people don't know me because they've wandered away. It's Isaiah 1. Yes, they have wandered away, they've been rebellious and proud and arrogant, but God doesn't want their demise, he wants their repentance. He wanted them to come back to him. He didn't want their villages to go up in smoke. And so God mourns over the fall of Israel, and he mourns even over the fall of, of Aram or Syria. And so when Judah rejoices... It's because they didn't want their enemies to repent and turn to the Lord. They wanted to watch their enemies burn. And for that, God disciplines them. The second reason that Judah needs to be punished is that Jerusalem is still, even, uh, even once all these other villages have fallen, and it's just Jerusalem, this lone bird in a cage, they still persist in their injustice. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, you've realized this is a theme in Isaiah. This is the, the, the call that Isaiah has for all of God's people, that they would turn from their injustice and that they would pursue righteousness and become people, this beacon of light for the whole world to see how humanity and society is supposed to work when God is king. And Jerusalem isn't doing it. He tells them in chapter 1, cease to do evil, learn to do good, correct oppression, and they're not. So why is Judah being punished? They rejoice when Israel falls instead of wanting them to repent. They are still living in injustice. And then uh, third, they, when things got tough, when the Rottweilers were attacking, they decided to put their trust in Assyria rather than in God. They decided that they would rather hedge their bets and call in the big guns than to trust in God to be faithful to them and to deliver them. And so in chapter 10, uh, verse 20, 
God has already said, I'm, I'm going to destroy Assyria or I'm going to punish Assyria. And then in verse 20, it says, In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, Assyria, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. So what he says is a day is coming when they will put their trust in God rather than in Assyria. The fact that they trusted in Assyria is one of the things that got them in trouble. It's like they were saying, let's not wait on the Lord. Let's not hope that God is going to deliver us or that God is going to show up and do something. Let's call in the, the people with the biggest uh, army and, and the most power, and they will be the ones to deliver us. And God is having none of it. And so for these three reasons, that they rejoice in the fall of their enemies and that they persist in injustice and that they put their trust in men, for those three reasons, God sends Assyria after them. And so is there any hope for Judah? This is the same thing Ahaz is thinking when he first said, oh, I need help. Is there any hope? Is there any hope for God's people? Well, Isaiah believes that there is hope. And, and he returns to this multiple times. It's kind of peppered throughout this, this chapter 7 through 12. Whenever the prophets, any prophet preaches, there's always a message of judgment and there's always a message of hope. And Isaiah believes there is hope for Judah. But the hope, true hope for God's people will not be in Assyria. In chapter 7, uh, Ahaz is afraid of Israel and Syria ganging up on him. And his heart shakes like trees of the forest shake before the wind. And before he sends the message off to please come help me, he send, God sends Isaiah to speak to Ahaz. And he says, you're going to be fine. They're not going to capture you. I will protect you. I'll, tell, I'll give you a sign. Whatever sign you want. And Ahaz says, oh, I'm not going to ask for a sign. That, that, when really it's just he just wants to call Assyria. And so in chapter 7, verse 14, it says, well, all right. Well, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, it's hard for anyone, I think, who's ever heard a Christmas song to not read that passage and just immediately think about Jesus. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to get there. But in the immediate context, what is the sign? What is the hope? The hope is these two nations are ganging up on you, but God is going to protect you, and I promise, and here's the sign, you're going to have a son. There will be a king and that king will be the, the hope for God's people. Are you with me? Hope for God's people comes in the form of a king specifically in the line of David because of Ahaz's son. Ahaz is in the line of David. Uh, okay, well, if this king is coming, isn't he just going to be more of the same? Isn't he just going to be another Ahaz, another Jotham, another Hezekiah, another Pekah, Ramalia, Rezin, Sennacherib? Isn't he going to be just like all the others? What is going to set this king apart? Well, chapter 9, he comes back to this in verse 4. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. So the, uh, his, being Judah's oppressor, this king is going to break that, that rod of oppression. Verse 6, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will do this. So what is going to set this king apart? What, what makes this beacon of hope different than all the other kings? Well, he's going to liberate God's people from this rod of oppression, and he is going to reign in a way that is different from every other king. 
This king is not like the other kings. He reigns differently. His reign will be one of justice and one of righteousness, which is not what you find in any other king. What you find in other kings is uh, self-preservation and fear and uh, injustice. But this king, this king is going to reign with justice and righteousness, and he's going to bring about this, uh, this age of, uh, of God's kingdom. And how is he going to do that? Why is it that this king will be able to execute justice and righteousness when the other kings don't? What makes him so special? He comes back in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. What sets this king apart is that the Spirit of God is on him, or in him. That the, the Spirit of, uh, of wisdom, and a Spirit of counsel, and, and a Spirit of understanding, and knowledge, and a Spirit of the fear of the Lord. He will have the, the Spirit of the Lord in a unique way that will empower him to do things that no other king does. And it will empower him to have a different kind of reign from all the other kings. But this isn't just a hope for Israel. Hope for Israel is never just hope for Israel. Uh, This turns out to be a hope for the whole world. In chapter 11, verse 10, In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. So the hope that Isaiah portrays for us is a king in the line of David who will execute justice and righteousness like no king before him because he will be empowered by God's spirit and so all nations will come to him for wisdom and counsel and guidance and so forth. How are we doing? You guys still with me? Anybody asleep? We're all okay? Just checking in. This is where you'd have a commercial break if if I could. Uh, This question of whether there is any hope is a perennial question. It is something that people have been asking themselves for thousands of years. It's the question that religious groups will ask. It's a question that, uh, that governments will ask or that armies in battle will ask, businesses that are about to go under. Families that are on the streets or threatening to break up. Parents watching their kids go down a dark path. Ask this question, is there any hope? And Isaiah says that there is. Uh, And the way that there is going to be hope is there is a king who is going to come and he will arrange the world rightly. And the claim of the church and the claim of the gospel and the claim of the Bible is that this king has come, that Jesus is this king, and that he alone is sovereign, and that he is a good and merciful and just king. Uh, In the early church, when when the church was trying to figure out how to describe Jesus and his significance... The way that the church would describe him is they talk about him as the coming king. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, it's the first page of the New Testament, and it starts with a genealogy, which to us doesn't sound like a real strong start. If you're making a, a movie and you start with a genealogy, people are going to like change the channel or walk out or whatever in the first few minutes. But, but what Matthew does is he starts with Abraham, and he works his way down to David, and then he follows the line of David all the way down to Jesus. 
to show you right from the beginning that Jesus is the rightful king of Israel, that he is in the line to the throne of David. And then uh, we, we meet uh, the Virgin Mary, and this angel appears to her and tells her she's going to have a son. Uh, and actually, it's, he's appearing to Joseph in Matthew. And in verse 21, the angel says to Joseph, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew tells us, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So you're a Jew living in the first century. You read the opening pages of uh, of Matthew, and the first thing you're thinking is, okay, here's a guy who's in the line of David, and Matthew thinks that he fulfills the prophecy, that he is the king who is coming, and he is the hope of Israel. And then in chapter 3 of Matthew... Jesus is baptized, and he comes up out of the water, and a dove descends. All right, this is what the text says. Matthew 3, uh, starting in verse, I don't know, uh, 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with him I am well pleased. So the Spirit of God comes to rest on Jesus, the heir to David's throne. Is there any question what Matthew is trying to get across? Matthew has Isaiah at the back of his brain, or maybe at the front of his brain. And he expects us to be picking up on all this, oh, this is, Jesus is fulfilling the hope of Isaiah chapter 7 through 12. He uh, then, when he's baptized, he immediately goes out and starts healing people, and he's challenging uh, power structures, and he's establishing justice and righteousness and order, and he, he goes from village to village creating these little pockets of redemption, and we read that all nations are coming to him. You have Jews who come to him for salvation, but you also have uh, Romans who are coming to him, and you have Samaritans who are coming to him, and Greeks who come to him. All nations are descending on this one king asking for deliverance. Is there any question what Matthew is trying to get across, what he's trying to tell us about Jesus? What's surprising in the Gospels is not that Jesus is this king of Isaiah, at least not once he's been in the you know, in the church for a while. What's surprising is how Jesus becomes this king. How is Jesus coronated as king? He is not, he doesn't seize the throne by uh, taking up arms and marching on Rome, which is what everybody expects him to do because he's going to be king. He doesn't go into the temple area and throw everybody out and establish that he, this is where his throne is going to be, you know, is to throw out all the Romans. Instead, how does Jesus become king? Well, if you fast forward to the end of the book, there are Roman soldiers who make him a crown, but they make it out of thorns, and they lay it on his head. And they make him a purple royal robe, and they hang it on his shoulders. And in mockery, they get down on their knees and they bow before the king of Israel. And Matthew draws all this out far more than he draws out the pain of the crucifixion. He spends a lot of time showing you how the Romans worship the God of Israel and how they pay homage to this king that they've given a throne and a royal robe. And I imagine maybe he even has a scepter. I don't know. How does Jesus become king? It's not by throwing out the Romans. It's not by defeating his enemies, but by allowing himself to be defeated by his enemies and absorbing all of their hatred and all of their indignation and all of their arrogance and all of their power into himself. It is by suffering and dying that Jesus becomes king. And then he's resurrected. This is the claim of the gospel. If if Jesus were just mocked 
and shamed and killed and buried, and that was the end. There would be no church. There would be no gospel. But the reason we are here this morning is because of a shared belief we have that the tomb of Jesus is empty. And what the resurrection means is that the greatest opponent to human life and well-being, which is death, has been defeated. And Jesus' resurrection is just the first fruit. It is only the first one of its kind. And someday when he returns, those who are dead will be raised and those who are still alive will be transformed into a glorious body like his. The resurrection means that the greatest opponent of human life and well-being has been defeated. And then after a few weeks Jesus, of Jesus being resurrected, he ascends to the throne, which is a part of the story that we often just skip over. We skip from resurrection to uh, return. But he ascends to the throne of the universe. And from there, he sends his spirit. The world that Jesus began to create, this little pockets of redemption and, and healing and people turning to him, that's not the world that we live in. We don't live in a world where everybody submits to the authority of Jesus. We live in authority where that's actually, or in a world where that is actually rather odd, when somebody fully submits to the authority of Jesus. Uh, but the fact is, Jesus is already king, and when he returns, he will make his kingdom known and visible and tangible, and every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow and confess that Jesus is sovereign. If you want to know what this is going to look like, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 11, he says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's Isaiah's description of what it will be like. It's a description of peace and of uh, security and also of the right ordering of the world, safety. And that's a world that we see in part, but, but it's a world that we see only through frosted glass. When you turn on the news or when you open your newspaper, when you go to school, when you go to work, you see these bits and pieces of redemption. And what it is, is we're seeing the world that is to come, but we're seeing it through frosted glass. Anywhere that justice is being served, Jesus is there. And anywhere that the hungry are being fed, Jesus is there. And wherever the poor who don't have a place to rest, where they, when they have a place to lay their head, Jesus is at work. Whenever the haves make sacrifice for the have-nots, that's Jesus. Wherever marriages are being restored, that's Jesus. If you came this morning without a commitment to Jesus, uh, if, if you came thinking that like, he's a nice guy, did some cool things, but you're not so sure about the whole sovereign Lord thing, uh, I'm here to tell you that he's a lot more than just a nice guy who did some cool stuff. That he has defeated the thing that we all have to look forward to, which is death. He has dealt it a mortal blow, and one day it will end. Uh, and right now he is the sovereign Lord. And if you do not submit to his sovereignty, then your life is a little insurrection insurrection. And it's time for you to recognize that you are not the master of your ship and you are not the captain of your soul. He is. And he is a good and merciful and compassionate and gracious master. 
Uh, and he is a master who will bring peace to the world. And it is only by our trying to live by our own standards and our own, forging our own truth and so on. That's what messes with the world. If we would just let him do his thing, uh, he will bring justice and peace and righteousness. Uh, maybe you're here and you do follow Jesus, but your uh, life has not been commensurate with the ways of the kingdom. Uh, you have more suspicion and hostility toward people who are poor or people who are on drugs than you have compassion or generosity. Uh, you have more hatred than grace for people of other ideologies or other lifestyles. You are jealous of people who have more than you and you are not satisfied until you have a little bit more. And what I would call you to do this morning is to remember what you were baptized into. You were not baptized to become more and more of the world. You were baptized to become something different and to submit to a different kind of reign and to live in a different <laughs> kind of system. Because it's only in that system that we have any hope. And so if there's something in your life, whether that's a relationship or a habit or a pattern of thinking that needs to change, then change it. Uh, Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray on one occasion, and he, he teaches them the Lord's Prayer, which uh, a bunch of us know, our, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done here on earth just like it's already being done in heaven. Jesus teaches us to pray, to beckon God to act, to poke at God and to evoke from him uh, that he would get up and act. To pro the, the point of prayer is to provoke God into getting up and doing something, to bring his kingdom to bear in the world. And if we are going to be kingdom people, then we have to begin to pray that God would go first, that when we go to speak with someone about Jesus or when we go to, uh, to do something in his name and to bring peace wherever it is, we pray that God will go first because if he doesn't get there first, we are toast. We do this, we, we begin with prayer, but then we bring the kingdom one of the ways we can do that is by making amends. If there is someone in your family that you're not on good terms with, uh, and there's someone that you have wounded, you need to make it right. It's gone on long enough. Uh, if there is a friend that between you and them there has been a growing wall of hostility and resentment, you need to act because walls like that don't belong in God's kingdom. What do you need to do to bring peace to your little circle, your sphere? Who do you need to go to? Who do you need to, uh, to help? Where do you need to be involved? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Spirit you may abound in hope. Let me pray for us. Oh God, we thank you for Isaiah. Uh, we thank you for this message of, uh, of a king who is coming. We thank you that you have not abandoned us, but that you have come to deliver us and to establish your kingdom and to make us into people of your kingdom. And we pray that you will uh, pour out your spirit on us just as you poured it out on Jesus, uh, that you will empower us also to be about the work of bringing justice and healing and so forth. And God, for all the times and all the places that we have uh, resented your reign or that we have wanted to couple your reign with some other thing, we pray that you will forgive us and that you will purge that desire from out of our hearts. 
Lord, we love you and we pray that you'll draw us closer to yourself and that you will send us out uh, empowered by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys.